Section 4 of The Two Paths. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Todd Albrick. The Two Paths by John Ruskin. Section 4, Lecture 2. The Unity of Art, Part 1. Part of an address delivered at Manchester, 14th March, 1859. Footnote. I was prevented by press of other engagements from preparing this address with the care I wished, and forced to trust to such expression as I could give at the moment to the points of principal importance. Reading, however, the close of the preceding lecture, which I thought contained some truths that would bear repetition, the whole was reported better than it deserved by Mr. Pittman of the Manchester Courier, and published nearly verbatim. I have here extracted from the published report the facts which I wish especially to enforce, and have a little cleared their expression. Its loose and colloquial character I cannot now help, unless by rewriting the whole, which it seems not worth while to do. End footnote. It is sometimes my pleasant duty to visit other cities, in the hope of being able to encourage their art students. But here it is my pleasanter privilege to come for encouragement myself. I do not know when I have received so much as from the report read this evening by Mr. Hammersley, bearing upon a subject which has caused me great anxiety. For I have always felt in my own pursuit of art, and in my endeavours to urge the pursuit of art on others, that while there are many advantages now that never existed before, there are certain grievous difficulties existing, just in the very cause that is giving the stimulus to art in the immense spread of the manufactures of every country which is now attending vigorously to art. We find that manufacture and art are now going on always together, that where there is no manufacture there is no art. I know how much there is of pretended art where there is no manufacture. There is much in Italy, for instance. No country makes so bold pretense to the production of new art as Italy at this moment yet no country produces so little. If you glance over the map of Europe, you will find that where the manufactures are strongest, there art also is strongest. And yet I always felt that there was an immense difficulty to be encountered by the students who were in these centres of modern movement. They had to avoid the notion that art and manufacture were in any respect one. Art may be healthily associated with manufacture, and probably in future will always be so, but the student must be strenuously warned against supposing that they can ever be one and the same thing, that art can ever be followed on the principles of manufacture. Each must be followed separately. The one must influence the other, but each must be kept distinctly separate from the other. It would be well if all students would keep clearly in their mind the real distinction between those words which we use so often, manufacture, art, and fine art. Manufacture is, according to the etymology and right use of the word, the making of anything by hands, directly or indirectly, with or without the help of instruments or machines. Anything proceeding from the hand of man is manufacture but it must have proceeded from his hand only, acting mechanically, and uninfluenced at the moment by direct intelligence. Then, secondly, art is the operation of the hand and the intelligence of man together. There is an art of making machinery, there is an art of building ships, an art of making carriages, and so on. All these, properly called arts, but not fine arts, are pursuits in which the hand of man and his head go together, working at the same instance. Then fine art is that in which the hand, the head, and the heart of man go together. Recollect this triple group. It will help you to solve many difficult problems. And remember that though the hand must be at the bottom of everything, it must also go to the top of everything. For fine art must be produced by the hand of man in a much greater and clearer sense than manufacture is. Fine art must always be produced by the subtlest of all machines, which is the human hand. No machine yet contrived, or hereafter contrivable, will ever equal the fine machinery of the human fingers. 
Thoroughly perfect art is that which proceeds from the heart, which involves all the noble emotions, associates with these the head, yet as inferior to the heart, and the hand, yet as inferior to the heart and head, and thus brings out the whole man. Hence it follows that since manufacture is simply the operation of the hand of man in producing that which is useful to him, it essentially separates itself from the emotions. When emotions interfere with machinery, they spoil it. Machinery must go evenly, without emotion. But the fine arts cannot go evenly. They always must have emotion ruling their mechanism, and until the pupil begins to feel, and until all he does associates itself with the current of his feeling, he is not an artist. But pupils in all the schools in this country are now exposed to all kinds of temptations which blunt their feelings. I constantly feel discouraged in addressing them, because I know not how to tell them boldly what they ought to do, when I feel how practically difficult it is for them to do it. There are all sorts of demands made upon them in every direction, and money is to be made in every conceivable way but the right way. If you paint as you ought, and study as you ought, depend upon it the public will take no notice of you for a long while. If you study wrongly, and try to draw the attention of the public upon you, supposing you to be clever students, you will get swift reward, but the reward does not come fast when it is sought wisely. It is always held aloof for a little while. The bright roads of early life are very quiet ones, hedged in from nearly all help or praise. But the wrong roads are noisy, vociferous everywhere with all kinds of demand upon you for art which is not properly art at all, and in the various meetings of modern interests money is to be made in every way. But art is to be followed only in one way. That is what I want mainly to say to you, or if not to you yourselves, for from what I have heard from your excellent master tonight, I know you are all going on rightly, you must let me say it through you to others. Our schools of art are confused by the various teaching and various interests that are now abroad among us. Everybody is talking about art and writing about it and more or less interested in it. Everybody wants art, and there is not art for everybody, and few who talk know what they are talking about. Thus students are led in all variable ways, while there is only one way in which they can make steady progress. For true art is always, and will be always, one. Whatever changes may be made in the customs of society, whatever new machines we may invent, whatever new manufactures we may supply, fine art must remain what it was two thousand years ago, in the days of Phidias. Two thousand years hence it will be, in all its principles, and in all its great effects upon the mind of man, just the same. Observe this that I say, please, carefully, for I mean it to the very utmost. There is but one right way of doing any given thing required of an artist. There may be a hundred wrong, deficient, or mannered ways, but there is only one complete and right way. Whatever two artists are trying to do the same thing with the same materials, and do it in different ways, one of them is wrong. He may be charmingly wrong or impressively wrong. Various circumstances in his temper may make his wrong pleasanter than any person's right. It may for him, under his given limitations of knowledge or temper, be better, perhaps, that he should err in his own way than try for anybody else's. But for all that, his way is wrong, and it is essential for all masters of schools to know what the right way is, and what right art is, and to see how simple and how single all right art has been since the beginning of it. But farther, not only is there but one way of doing things rightly, but there is only one way of seeing them, and that is seeing the whole of them, without any choice or more intense perception of one point than another, owing to our special idiosyncrasies. Thus, when Titian or Tintoret look at a human being, they see at a glance the whole of its nature, outside and in, all that it has of form, of color, of passion, or of thought, saintliness and loveliness, 
fleshy body and spiritual power, grace or strength or softness or whatsoever other quality, those men will see to the full and so paint that when narrower people come to look at what they have done, every one may, if he chooses, find his own special pleasure in the work. The sensualist will find sensuality in Titian, the thinker will find thought, the saint sanctity, the colorist color, the anatomist form, and yet the picture will never be a popular one in the full sense, for none of these narrower people will find their special taste so alone consulted as that the qualities which would ensure their gratification shall be sifted or separated from others. They are checked by the presence of the other qualities which ensure the gratification of other men. Thus Titian is not soft enough for the sensualist. Correggio suits him better. Titian is not defined enough for the formalist. Leonardo suits him better. Titian is not pure enough for the religionist. Raphael suits him better. Titian is not polite enough for the man of the world. Van Dyck suits him better. Titian is not forcible enough for the lovers of the picturesque. Rembrandt suits him better. So Correggio is popular with a certain set, and Van Dyck with a certain set, and Rembrandt with a certain set. All are great men, but of inferior stamp, and therefore Van Dyck is popular and Rembrandt is popular. Footnote. And Murillo, of all true painters, the narrowest, feeblest, and most superficial, for those reasons, the most popular. End footnote. But nobody cares much at heart about Titian. Only there is a strange undercurrent of everlasting murmur about his name, which means the deep consent of all great men that he is greater than they, the consent of those who, having sat long enough at his feet, have found in that restrained harmony of his strength there are indeed depths of each balanced power more wonderful than all those separate manifestations in inferior painters, that there is a softness more exquisite than Correggio's, a purity loftier than Leonardo's, a force mightier than Rembrandt's, a sanctity more solemn even than Raphael's. Do not suppose that in saying this of Titian I am returning to the old eclectic theories of Bologna, for all those eclectic theories, observe, were based not upon an endeavor to unite the various characters of nature, which it is possible to do, but the various narrownesses of taste, which it is impossible to do. Rubens is not more vigorous than Titian, but less vigorous, but because he is so narrow-minded as to enjoy vigor only, he refuses to give the other qualities of nature which would interfere with that vigor and with our perception of it. Again, Rembrandt is not a greater master of chioscuro than Titian. He is a less master, but because he is so narrow-minded as to enjoy chioscuro only, he withdraws from you the splendor of hue which would interfere with this, and gives you only the shadow in which you can at once feel it. Now all these specialties have their own charm in their own way and there are times when the particular humour of each man is refreshing to us from its very distinctness. But the effort to add any other qualities to this refreshing one instantly takes away the distinctiveness, and therefore the exact character to be enjoyed in its appeal to a particular humour in us. Our enjoyment arose from a weakness meeting a weakness, from a partiality in the painter fitting to a partiality in us, and giving us sugar when we wanted sugar, and myrrh when we wanted myrrh. But sugar and myrrh are not meat, and when we want meat and bread, we must go to better men. The eclectic schools endeavor to unite these opposite partialities and weaknesses. They trained themselves under masters of exaggeration, and tried to unite opposite exaggerations. That was impossible. They did not see that the only possible eclecticism had been already accomplished. The eclecticism of temperance, which by the restraint of force gains higher force, and by the self-denial of delight gains higher delight. This, you will find, is ultimately the case with every true and right master. At first, while we are tyros in art, or before we have earnestly studied the man in question, we shall see little in him, or perhaps see, as we think, deficiencies, 
we shall fancy he is inferior to this man in that, and to the other man in the other. But as we go on studying him, we shall find that he has got both that and the other, and both in a far higher sense than the man who seemed to possess those qualities in excess. Thus in Turner's lifetime, when people first looked at him, those who liked rainy weather said he was not equal to Copley Fielding. But those who looked at Turner long enough found that he could be much more wet than Copley Fielding, when he chose. The people who liked force said that Turner was not strong enough for them. He was effeminate. They liked De Vint, nice strong tone, or Cox, great greeny dark masses of color, solemn feeling of the freshness and depth of nature. They liked Cox. Turner was too hot for them. Had they looked long enough, they would have found that he had far more force than De Vint, far more freshness than Cox when he chose, only united with other elements, and that he didn't choose to be cool if nature had appointed the weather to be hot. The people who liked Prout said, Turner had not firmness of hand. He did not know enough about architecture. He was not picturesque enough. Had they looked at his architecture long, they would have found that it contained subtle picturesquenesses, infinitely more picturesque than anything of Prout's. People who liked Calcott said that Turner was not correct or pure enough, had no classical taste. Had they looked at Turner long enough, they would have found him as severe when he chose as the greater Poussin, Calcott a mere vulgar imitator of other men's high breeding. And so throughout, with all thoroughly great men, their strength is not seen at first, precisely because they unite in due place and measure every great quality. Now the question is whether, as students, we are to study only these mightiest men who unite all greatness, or whether we are to study the works of inferior men who present us with the greatness which we particularly like. That question often comes before me when I see a strong idiosyncrasy in a student, and he asks me what he should study. Shall I send him to a true master who does not present the quality in a prominent way in which the student delights, or send him to a man with whom he has direct sympathy? It is a hard question, for very curious results have sometimes been brought out, especially in late years, not only by students following their own bent, but by their being withdrawn from teaching altogether. I have just named a very great man in his own field, Prout. We all know his drawings, and love them. They have a peculiar character which no other architectural drawings ever possessed, and which no others can possess, because all Prout's subjects are being knocked down or restored. Prout did not like restored buildings any more than I do. There will never be any more Prout drawings, nor could he have been what he was or expressed with that mysteriously effective touch that peculiar delight in broken and old buildings, unless he had been withdrawn from all high art influence. You know that Prout was born of poor parents, that he was educated down in Cornwall, and that for many years all the art teaching he had was his own or the fishermen's. Under the keels of the fishing boats, on the sands of our southern coasts, Prout learned all that he needed to learn about art. Entirely by himself, he felt his way to this particular style, and became the painter of pictures which I think we should all regret to lose. It becomes a very difficult question what that man would have been had he been brought under some entirely wholesome artistic influence. He had immense gifts of composition. I do not know any man who had more power of invention than Prout, or who had a sublimer instinct in his treatment of things. But being entirely withdrawn from all artistical help, he blunders his way to that shortcoming representation which by the very reason of its shortcoming has a certain charm we should all be sorry to lose. And therefore I feel embarrassed when a student comes to me in whom I see a strong instinct of that kind, and cannot tell whether I ought to say to him, Give up all your studies of old boats, and keep away from the seashore, and come up to the Royal Academy in London, and look at nothing but Titian. It is a difficult thing to make up one's mind to say that. However, I believe, on the whole, we may wisely leave such matters in the hands of Providence. 
that if we have the power of teaching the right to anybody, we should teach them the right. If we have the power of showing them the best thing, we should show them the best thing. There will always, I fear, be enough want of teaching, and enough bad teaching, to bring out very curious erratical results if we want them. So if we are to teach at all, let us teach the right thing, and ever the right thing. There are many attractive qualities inconsistent with rightness. Do not let us teach them. Let us be content to waive them. There are attractive qualities in Burns, and attractive qualities in Dickens, which neither of those writers would have possessed if the one had been educated and the other had been studying higher nature than that of Cockney London. But those attractive qualities are not such as we would seek in a school of literature. If we want to teach young men a good manner of writing, we should teach it from Shakespeare, not from Burns, from Walter Scott, and not from Dickens. And I believe that our schools of painting are at present inefficient in their action, because they have not fixed on this high principle what are the painters to whom to point, nor boldly resolved to point to the best if determinable. It is becoming a matter of stern necessity that they should give a simple direction to the attention of the student, and that they should say, This is the mark you are to aim at, and you are not to go about to the print shops and peep in to see how this engraver does that and the other engraver does the other, and how a nice bit of character has been caught by a new man, and why this odd picture has caught the popular attention. You are to have nothing to do with all that. You are not to mind about popular attention just now. But here is a thing which is eternally right and good. You are to look at that, and see if you cannot do something eternally right and good, too. But suppose you accept this principle, and resolve to look to some great man, Titian or Turner, or whomsoever it may be, as the model of perfection in art. Then the question is, since this great man pursued his art in Venice, or in the fields of England, under totally different conditions from those possible to us now, how are you to make your study of him effective here in Manchester? How bring it down into patterns, and all that you are called upon as operatives to produce? How make it the means of your livelihood, and associate inferior branches of art with this great art? That may become a serious doubt to you. You may think there is some other way of producing clever and pretty and saleable patterns than going to look at Titian or any other great man. And that brings me to the question, perhaps the most vexed question of all amongst us just now, between conventional and perfect art. You know that among architects and artists there are, and have been almost always, since art became a subject of much discussion, two parties, one maintaining that nature should be always altered and modified, and that the artist is greater than nature. They do not maintain indeed in words, but they maintain an idea that the artist is greater than the divine maker of these things, and can improve them. While the other parties say that he cannot improve nature, and that nature on the whole should improve him. That is the real meaning of the two parties, the essence of them. The practical result of their several theories being that the idealists are always producing more or less formal conditions of art, and the realists striving to produce in all their art either some image of nature or record of nature. These, observe, being quite different things, the image being a resemblance and the record something which will give information about nature, but not necessarily imitate it. End of section 4 Recording by Todd Albrecht